Welcome to Build Your Own CPU Part 1. In this series, I'll be explaining the design of the CPU I built and the choices I made for this design. This was inspired by Ben Eater's videos. I don't intend to explain the ins and outs of logic gates, but I will explain how the CMOS circuits I made work. Um, I wanted to build something a bit different. I found many original CPU designs based around ICs, many discrete transistor designs based on CPUs like 6502s and Z80s, but I didn't find any for original CPU designs based on discrete transistors. So my goal was discrete parts only for the CPU, transistors, capacitors, resistors and diodes, and my own design of CPU. Using TTO or MOS techniques uses power in the pull-up resistors, and this also limits the fan out. So I decided to go with CMOS, if this only uses current when it's actually switching. As I wanted to design a CPU, I decided the motherboard was not part of my goal, so this could be IC based. I could always do this in transistors later if I felt like it. The motherboard provides RAM, ROM, keyboard, graphics, and the clock signals, just like any other PC motherboard. The CPU architecture is based around the register transfer language. I also picked the PCB size to be 100 by 100 or 50 by 100, as this is the cheapest way of getting boards made by JLC PCB. And these are all joined together by hundreds of links, as plugs and sockets are just too expensive. Now, this is the logical layout of the CPU. It's very close to the physical layout. The control lines form the control bus that runs across the top and feeds the control signals down to the separate cards that form the registers, etc. The data bus runs across the top just below the control bus, and this feeds the data down to the cards in the same manner. On the left, we can see the adder. This is fed by registers A and B. The B register has a control board that manipulates the data from the B register to enable subtraction, among other tasks. There's also a dotted line from the status register. This is for any carry or borrow bits. Just to the right of the adder are the AND, OR and XOR boards. Due to the way the adder is built, these signals can't be sourced from the adder, so separate function boards were needed. The A and B registers feed these as well. There's also a logical shift right module fed from just the A register. There's no logical shift left, as this can be performed by adding a value to itself, and this saves on transistors and instructions. There's only room for 16 instructions, as we'll see later. In the middle, there is the status register. This holds the K flag, generates and holds the zero flag, and also has the C register. C register is what feed is fed to to the carry of the adder and acts as a buffer. So the act of adding with carry and generating a carry that can happen at the same time. There's no master slave flip flops anywhere. So read and writes to registers have to be done on different clock cycles. Registers R1 and R2 are just general purpose registers to save on memory accesses. The program counter is basically just another register that is used to keep a tab of the next memory location to be used. The memory address register below this is basically just holds the address bus and feeds this directly out of the CPU. Further to the right is the data bus buffer. This is to separate the internal data bus from the external data bus. This allows internal operations to happen without affecting the whole system's data bus. The instruction register is joined to the external data bus to receive the next instruction. This feeds direct to the instruction decoder. The instruction decoder receives its clock signals from the motherboard as well. All right, so let's suppose we want to move data from register one all the way around to register two. When the clock signal goes high, the move instruction will set register one to output enable high, which in register one's data onto the data bus. This feeds round and through to register two. The high clock allows the data to flow from the output of register one to the input of register two. The addition of the pulse signal high allows the data to flow into register two. After short pause to allow the data to settle, 
The pulse will be switched low, locking the data into register 2. After another short pause, the clock will switch low, ending the cycle. We'll go through the clock and pulse signals in detail a bit later. All right, let's say we want to add register 1 to register 2. First, we move register 1 into register A, and then we move register 2 into register B. We now have two values in the A register and B registers. These feed into the adder. The adder is always active and does not need any clock pulses. The added data will be waiting at the output buffers, ready to go almost immediately. When just doing an add, the B control ball just passes the B data straight through to the adder. If you're doing an add with carry, then the carry flag will be have been fed into the C register on the status board and is fed through to the adder carry input. If you're doing a simple add, then this carry will be held low. The adder output will be enabled on the next clock cycle and the results will be fed into register 2. Any carry will be saved in the carry flag on the status register. The next pulse high to low will lock this data into register 2. If you're doing subtraction, then the B control board inverts the B register data and sets the carry to enable a 2's complement addition, which is the same as a subtraction. If you're doing subtraction with borrow, then the carry flag will be passed through instead of holding the carry input high. Again, the data is clocked out to the destination, in this case, register 2 again. All right. Because of the minimal transistor count design of the adder, as we'll see later, the adder does not generate any ANDs, ORs, or XORs, so I had to design these function boards separately. The register cards all have their internal data fed out a separate bus, which I refer to as the R bus, short for register bus. This output is constantly on and is not controlled by the register output control signals. This is the signal that the A and B registers feed to the adder. It is also fed across to the AND, OR and XOR boards. These continuously generate the AND, OR and XOR signals of the A and B registers. So to get an AND, just load the A and B registers and set the AND output enable on and clock this into the destination. In this case, register 2 again. For an OR, do the same, but enable the OR output enable. And for an XOR, just enable the XOR output enable. Alright, now the logical shift right. Load register A. The R bus of register A feeds into the logical shift right board. This feeds input data bit 1 into output data bit zero, and so forth through all the bits, with bit zero feeding the input of the carry flag. Bit seven will be loaded with the zero. On the next clock cycle, the data for the chosen destination, in this case, register one. All right, for a branch or a jump, whichever you want to call it, all you need to do is feed the address, into the program counter. So for instance, to branch to the location stored in register one, just move register one into the program counter. The program counter is now loaded with the address of the next instruction. When the beginning of an instruction cycle happens, the program counter gets loaded into the memory address register and out onto the address bus. The memory address bus register R bus is the address lines out to the CPU. So on the next clock cycle, the instruction that is being pointed to will be loaded into the instruction register and into the instruction decoder. The final timings of the instruction cycles will be covered later. I think that's enough for this video. In the next, I'll explain some of the CMOS circuitry and the pitfalls to look out for.